Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. He is worthy of the praise, yes. the glory, and the honor. Amen. Praise the Lord, sister. Oh, yes, so true. And uh, I hope that was my water. So yes. from last night, <laughs> I've been to a few churches. I had smell of it before I drank it. You know? <laughs> Make sure it wasn't spiked or something. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, I have several apologies to make, you know, uh, but uh, I'm not going to make them tonight. But uh, I love all the Whitehead family and all the Cap family and all those in between. And uh, I have no favorites except the one I'm talking to at the time. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I think Corey's my favorite, though. That is one good-looking young one right there, I want to tell you. Oh man, yeah, I tell you, and he's a uh, he's a good kid. I've been knowing this family uh, since a, a long time ago. I, man, I think in '82. So that's um, what uh, 20, uh, 18, about forty years I've known them. So, so it's been a long time, and I've I've uh, enjoyed all of it. Uh, they are precious people, and. I've enjoyed just being a part of the lives. But they have preached me to death. I, you know, when I'm preaching, as many of Brother Otis's family, Brother Tommy's family, Brother Bruce, they've heard of everything I've got to say. Now, why they keep coming back, I think it's they're hoping that I'll preach a good sermon after a while. But I told them last night I felt like I had... It was one of the worst summers I've ever preached. And Sister Brenda said, I've heard worse. Oh. <laughs> Now, I hope she meant she'd heard worse from other people, but I took it as she'd heard worse from me. You know. But, uh, boy, you're trying to figure out what to preach. And then I remembered that we all need it over and over. Repetition is the, uh, is the best teacher. And so uh, that's why we have four Gospels. You know, Jesus reminds us over and over and over of our great truth. One of the things that is... I, to be perfectly honest, I have five sermon outlines with me tonight. I have wrestled all day, got up this morning, rested. Thank you for the opportunity to rest. We were really tired yesterday, from, uh, almost two weeks of of uh, going, and and so we were able to get some good rest. But I got up this morning, spent some time in the book, and trying to find the mind of God about the sermon tonight. And I'm going to preach on a sermon I do not know if I've preached here before. I don't think so. I, I think I have preached it at the family camp for Brother Otis uh, back sometime, and don't think it was recent. Uh, I don't keep as good a records on where I preach and what I preach as I ought to. I figure nobody pays any attention to what I say anyway, no, so if I preach over, they're not going to meet. But always in a meeting, somebody will come up and say, you preached that on January the 13th, you know. And I said, well, why didn't you do what I told you did? <laughs> you know, and uh, and uh, the uh, man, uh, lady said to her pastor, you know, you just preach that all the time. That's all you ever preach. And he said, well, when you start obeying that, I'll turn to something else and preach on it. Yeah. But, um, but I, I had not planned even all day today to preach this message until tonight. And so um, I want to have the mind of God. One of the things that bothers me um, today, and I mentioned it last night, but it's an overriding burden on my heart, but it's an overriding thought of my mind and heart as a preacher and, and uh, as a teacher. And uh, up until COVID, I traveled a lot in, in uh, Eastern Europe and China and Saipan and teaching. Uh, uh, is this on? We would have. Okay. Uh, teaching, you can hear me back there, can't you? Okay. Um, and so uh, I've just seen uh, a, a coldness and yeah. indifference to the things of God yeah. and, uh, and a deterioration in our world that is uh, just overwhelming. Mm. And I mentioned that last night. We traced the origin of that back to sin. It was there in the garden where sin comes. If you've ever been guilty of or know someone that is, of blaming God for something. I've had people who've lost a child or lost a mate or lost a friend, and they want to know why 
God did this or where God was in it all. And um, and I said, if you want to blame something, blame sin. Yes. Uh, it's not God who has created this world to be the problem that it is today. Mm. It's sin in the world today. Amen. Amen. And, uh, but God's made a cure for that. Uh, through Jesus Christ, we can have eternal life. Yes. We can have hope. We can have peace with Him. And yet, I'm afraid that many in the church today don't know Him. Mm. They know about Him, but they don't know Him. For a generation now, we have Christianized a lot of people who've never been converted by the power of God. Tonight I want to preach on being made a new creature. Being made a new creation, if you will. So turn in your Bible to the book of of Second um, uh, Corinthians chapter 5 and Ephesians chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians 6 and Ephesians 5. First John three and first John two and John fourteen and Luke eighteen and Luke nineteen. What does it mean to be a child of God? What does it mean to be a Christian? The term is used loosely today. America is referred to as a Christian nation. It means that we uh, our primary God is supposed to be Christ, our Lord. But we're far from a Christian nation yes, sir. anymore. We're never, I don't know that we've ever been a Christian nation. Christianity has been uh, prominent in American history. but we uh, And we were founded on many biblical principles. But nationally, I don't know that we've ever been a Christian nation. We've just been a nation with a lot of Christians in it. Mm. But that's moving rapidly away. Yes, sir. Most churches are declining in membership. They're not growing in membership. Mm. Most churches have compromised the Word of God and turned completely away from it. Mm. Uh, they only have a form of what used to be. When I first got saved, when I first answered the call to preach, uh, the fastest growing churches in America were fundamental Bible-believing churches. Uh, more people were being converted in those churches than in the history, uh, in recent history. Churches were full. In the church I got saved in for a two year period, we never had a service that somebody didn't walk the aisle and get saved, born again. Never in two full years. I mean, a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, and a Wednesday night. The Wednesday night that I attended church just to date the woman who's now my wife. Uh, knowing nobody at that church but her and her mom, uh, that night there was no place to sit and the men were standing all the way around the sides of the building inside because there was nowhere for them to sit down. It was just a regular prayer meeting night. Mm -hmm. We soon outgrew our building and and because people were getting converted and uh, marriages were being put back together and homes were being uh, salvaged. Uh, Young people were answering the call to preach. Uh, uh, businessmen were 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 shutting their businesses down during revivals like this. And we had four revivals a year that lasted from Sunday morning through the next Sunday night, mm. right. four a year, and they were attended. And almost every night grew till the one of the last meetings that uh, uh, before I surrendered my heart to Christ. When the last meetings, uh, we probably had six or seven hundred people present. And the only room that the pastor had was the four square feet that he stood in at the pulpit. There was somebody standing or sitting on every other piece of the floor. And every pew was filled. You say, well, what happened? Well, there's a falling away, a movement away from God, a movement uh, back to the world, if you will, a deterioration. And uh, yet many people who name the name of Christ today live such a life that you can see none of Christ in their life. Mm. In the church, there's a coldness and an indifference to the things of God. But yet when you read what a believer is and how one becomes a believer, those things are just totally opposites. When a man is saved by the grace of God, he's literally made a new creation. Yes, amen. 
We demonstrated that somewhat last night. But open your Bible, and and uh, so I'll probably preach these five sermons as they run together, okay? Uh, to the book of Second Corinthians and uh, chapter five. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, and and uh, really is. Um, uh, talking about that which motivated him. And uh, he says in this fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, and uh, if you will, look in, uh, in, uh, uh, in verse 13. They really have said Paul was somewhat crazy and lost his mind. And uh, uh, he said in verse 12, for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may know somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, they were saying, Paul, you've gone mad. You've, you're beside yourself. You've, you've lost your mind. Um, and you're crazy. He said, if we be beside ourselves, it is to God or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Literally, he said, look, you're going to have to make up your mind. He said, but for the love of Christ constraineth us. Well, we could stop there and preach a whole sermon on what motivates us. Amen. Paul didn't say, my love for Christ motivates me. He said, it's understanding Christ's love for me that motivates me. Wow. Yeah. Why do you do what you do? Um, is it for Christ? I love my wife. We've been married 55 years in December. And, uh, and I love her for who she is, not for what she can give me or do for me, but for who she is. Um, and I'm afraid that we've lost the keen awareness of God's love for us. Mm. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son for us. Yes. God gave His Son to die the cruel death of the cross because He loved you and me. Mm. And uh, I'm going to tell you... Um, We've grown cold in that understanding that God loved me that much. Mm. I wouldn't give my kids for one of you. Right, preacher. Yeah. You wouldn't give your kids for me. Uh, sometimes people would give their life for their nation or their life for a good cause. But Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Mm. When we were rebels against God. Yes. Paul said, it's the love of Christ constraineth me. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Literally what he says is, we don't have to die anymore because Christ died for us. Now the death he's speaking of there is not physical death. He's talking about the death that separates us from God. Mm. And in Christ's death on the cross, he died once for all, so that we no longer have to die that death. Mm. You don't have to be separated from God. Amen. And that He died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. Why did He die for you? He says here He died for us so we would no longer live for ourselves. Mm but we would live for Him who died for us and rose again. You know what your purpose in life is? To live for Christ who died for you. Mm. But that's not what we're living for. Mm. We live for material gain and popularity and get a bigger piece of the rock or to be known by somebody important or very few of us really, if we're honest, are living for Jesus Christ. Mm. Paul said, for me to die is gain, That's right. but to live is Christ. Amen. He said, while I'm living here, my whole purpose is Christ. Yes. Yes. I live for Christ. I'm building a screened-in porch on the back of my house. It's only 10, 12 feet by 14 feet, so it's not very big at all. 
And uh, I began it a year ago, October. I'm really slow. There's nothing wrong with you having a house or having a car. There's nothing wrong with you having a bank account. If it is all His, and it is all His, it's all His. Are you living for Him? Did He get your permission? I made a fatal mistake. I told the Lord when I started, I said, Lord, whatever it costs me for this room, I will give that much above my tithes and offerings to missions. So I started building, Brother Bruce, and the price of lumber skyrocketed. <laughs> and it's cost me twice as much as I thought it would be. And I said, Lord, now we got to cap that thing to where we were when I made that promise. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with things but there's something wrong when things are your master and Christ is your servant. Mm. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong when you're more concerned about your health than you are your relationship to Christ. Mm. There's something wrong. And the wrongness, I think, can be traced to the fact that maybe we don't know Him as well as we think. But then, to hurry on, look at verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Yes. Yes. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Yes. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Mm. Now, listen to me. When you were born again by the Spirit of God, God made you a new creation. You remember last night I talked about the trichotomy that was in us? The fact that we were born, we were created body, soul, and spirit, and then the spirit of man died in Adam, and we receive Adam's nature, which is now only body and soul, but not spirit. And at the new birth, we're made new. We're made new by the power of God. Look in John chapter 3, a familiar text with us. John chapter 3. Powerful text. Jesus came and and he preached this message and he said to Nicodemus who came to him by night. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was a religious ruler and, and uh, he understood some of the things of Judaism, but he said, unless we know that no man can do these miracles except uh, thou be of God or God be with him. And Jesus said to him, You must be born again. Yeah. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He said, Unless a man is born of the Spirit... He cannot see the kingdom of God, neither can he enter the kingdom of God. Right. So what does it mean? Is there a difference? Or is those both the same? They're different. He said, first of all, unless a man is born again, he not, cannot comprehend the kingdom of God. Mm. And then he said, unless a man be born again of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we become a new creation through the new birth which is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. It's God's Spirit that does a work to the repentant sinner, and that work is to make him a new creature. Now, get me, the work of the Holy Spirit is not to take him to heaven, and the work of the Spirit of God is not to keep him out of hell. The work of the Spirit of God in the new birth is to make him a spiritual being different than anything he's ever been. Yeah. It's not the Spirit of God who helps him turn over a new leaf or to take a new set of standards or to start living a new way. It's the Holy Spirit that makes him something brand new, Amen. something 
totally different than he's ever been. And unless he's made totally different than he's ever been, he's not born again. And that new birth is by the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit of God. Turn to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. I teach this book when I'm overseas sometimes, and, and uh, it's a precious book. And uh, it is in this second chapter that is profound. He says in chapter 2 and verse 1, And you, he hath, who, ha, you, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in a time past you walked according to the course of this world, mm. according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now working in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, for even we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. Amen. And here's what he said. You were dead, separated from God, and a carnal, fleshly being. Yes. And at the point of conversion, the work of the Holy Spirit, upon your repentance and faith in Christ, God the Spirit made you alive. That's what the word quicken means. It means to make alive. Right. So that person who was dead was made alive at the point of salvation by the work of the Holy Spirit and that was instantaneous. Mm. Amen. Amen. It was instantaneous. Now let me ask you this question and it may be humorous but it is bears a point. If you go to the morgue today or to a funeral and you go view the corpse and you look down in his face and someone said, uh, this man is alive. And you'd say, well, no, he's not alive. Mm. He doesn't have any of the characteristics of being alive. He can't move. He's not breathing. His heart's not beating. He's going to run a brainwave. He has no characteristics of life. But if you're viewing that corpse and he sets up and says, how are you? <laughs> then they're going to be viewing your corpse. <laughs> uh, and if you say, well, this man that I see sitting on the front pew is dead. And you see him moving his arms and he's talking and he's breathing and his heart's beating. And you're going to say, this guy's a nut. The one in the coffin is alive and the one that's sitting on the pew is dead. Uh, the spiritual aspect of life and death is the same. We who are born of Adam's nature are born spiritually dead, separated from God, with no ability to communicate with God, to commune with God, apart from the work of God. We are totally spiritually dead. And only until God comes and by His Spirit makes us alive through the new birth can we be called alive? God says here in this passage, you who were dead, and when you were dead, you followed the course of this world. You live like this world. You did what this world does. This was your dream. This was your motivation. This was your activity. This was your goal. This was your life. You were just doing what came naturally for a spiritually dead person. But at the new birth, you were totally changed. And made alive. And now, you, you're a spiritual person. And you no longer can be comfortable in those things that once you did. True. Amen. Because you're born again. So it's the new birth. It's the power of God that quickened us, that made us alive, if you will. Look in Ephesians 5, 8. You're right there. Just turn over to the fifth chapter. Ephesians 5 and verse 8. He said, For you were sometimes in darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. When you were lost, you were in darkness. Spiritual darkness. But he said, Now you've been made the children of light. Mm. Let me ask you, has, have you become a light? Amen. If we turn off all the lights in here, um, you're going to say it's dark. But when we turn the lights on, 
It's a total different atmosphere. Jesus said, if you've been born again, you've been changed by the power of God, you are the light of the world. It's only in believers that have been born again can the world see God. Amen. It's only through us that the world can see God. Good. And if we live in darkness, we live according to the world. If we live by the ways of the world, if we're guided by the flesh, we're guided by the world, then we do not have His Spirit and the world can see nothing in us. Mm. We live like they do, dream like they do, hope like they do, and our goal and our ambitions are toward that. And by the way, just tacking on church and just tacking on giving or tacking on some religious activity does not indicate the new birth. Right. Mm. So, he says we are the children of light. Look at First John, if you will, hurriedly. First John. Uh, it's the same John that wrote uh, uh, John three sixteen. For God shall love the world. But look at First John chapter three. I don't think we've studied these scriptures much lately. John chapter three, and I want to begin reading in verse one. Now, I'm going to read a few verses, but it's worth bearing out. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. You remember John said in John chapter 1, He came into His own, but His own received Him not. But as to many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the children of God. Now listen to me. That word power means that He quickened them and made them alive and now they've become children of God by the work of the Holy Spirit and now they have no longer control by the nature of Adam but have a brand new nature. Amen. And John said here in this gospel, he said, because we knew him not. Beloved, uh, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. Whosoever, notice this, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Yes, yes. You get that? If you have the hope of Christ, your motivating drive of your heart is to be pure like Christ. Amen. Mm. Look at verse 4. Whosoever committed sin transgressions also the law for sin is a transgression of the law. Right. Whoever committed sin, that man who lives still by the flesh and by the old nature, he continues in his sin, he's a transgressor, he's a breaker of the law. And verse 5, and ye know that he was manifest, that his Christ was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. How much sin is in Christ? Tell me. No. None. And he was manifest to take away our what? Sin. Okay? So what was the purpose in Christ's coming to do what? To take away our sin, sin through the birth, new birth. Look at verse 5, 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now I didn't write that. That's the work of the Spirit of God. Right. This is the same John who wrote John 3.16. Right. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now that word sinneth is in the present linear tense. It means he does not keep on living the way he did. Amen. He was a rebel. Now he has surrendered and submitted himself to the authority of God. Hallelujah. Don't let anybody today tell you, and be careful how you use this statement. You say, preacher, do you believe you're perfect? No. I don't believe any man will be perfect. But I'm going to tell you, every man can have a perfect heart. Yes. He can desire above all things to be holy and to be clean like his Lord. Amen. When you hear preachers say this often, or anybody else say you, says this, well, nobody's perfect. What they're doing is most often using that phrase to excuse their own carnality and disobedience to God. God says if a man abideth in Christ and Christ abideth in him, he said this man does not continue sin, he sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him or known him. 
What are you saying? I'm saying there's a difference between a lost man and a saved man. There's a difference between a man who's never been born again and a man who's been born again. There's a difference between a man who does not know Christ and a man who's been made a new creature by the Spirit of God in Christ Jesus. There's a difference between the lost and the saved that is so profound Amen. that you can know it and you can know a man's heart. Mm. The Bible makes it clear. I hear a lot of people say this, well, you can't know my heart. I was uh, had a church member some years ago, and first church I pastored, and and uh, <coughs> and so uh, I went by her house with an evangelist. We had a revival meeting, and and uh, her and her husband had not come uh, that Sunday, and so we rode by there, going somewhere else really, and she was out in the yard mowing the grass in a bikini. I mean, little. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, one of them itsy bitsy teeny wings. <laughs> so I just pulled in the driveway. I wasn't intending to see her. But since she was out in public dressed that way, I decided her pastor would pay her a visit. So I just pulled in the driveway. When I pulled in the driveway, she ran in the house, left the lawnmower. And when I knocked on the door, she opened the door, still in that itsy bitsy teeny weeny bikini. And the first words out of her mouth is, you can't see my heart by the way I'm dressed. I said, no, but I can see everything else you got. <laughs> by the way, listen to me. You can know. You say, well, how can you know? Well, she understood what she was saying. She understood that you could. She understood that I could see her heart. Mm. She understood that. You know why a woman in a short dress or a, a revealing dress? You, you can just prove it. If you walk up among them, most often you'll find them tugging at the hem trying to get it down, or tugging at the top trying to get it up. Well, why are they tugging if they're wearing it? Why are they tugging? Why are they just proud of what they're, they're not? Why are they tugging? Because they know it's wrong. I walked up to a car and all I could see sticking out from under it were two sets of legs and I was looking for a man who was a member of our church and there was somebody looking under the hood standing up and I didn't know him and but I knew the truck so I walked up to it and this guy under the truck is laying a cussing on. I mean he's cussing the truck and cussing everything that there was and I kicked him on the foot and I said, Hey, this is your preacher. Hush your mouth. He come crawling out from the truck. He said, Preacher, I'm sorry. I said, you ought to be sorry. You ought to be sorry of God. Mm, yeah, amen. But you say, well, how can you know? Well, we'll look, we'll look at it if you were. Verse 6. Whosoever abides in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil uh, sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Man is manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. He can't go on that way. He can't go on living a rebel's life. Because he's born of God, in this the children of God are manifest, mm. and the children of the devil. He said, by their actions, you can know their heart by how they live and how they talk and their attitude and their desires and their motivation. You can tell whether they're children of God or whether they're children of the devil. Right, preacher. Amen. And he that doeth not righteousness is not of God. Now it's time that we got back to some old-fashioned Bible understanding that if you've been born again, you've been born with a whole new set of values, a whole new set of desires that are totally different than the world, and you may have a fight with the flesh, but no longer is the nature of man in control, but now the Spirit of God that dwelleth in us now is on the king of the mountain, and that Spirit of God says to us, you can't go that way. Amen, that's not the way you are. That's not who you made out of. The night I got saved, I had a pack of Camel cigarettes in my shirt pocket, and I loved every one of them. I smoked three packs a day, seven days a week. I mean, boy, I couldn't afford it today, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, I listen, and nobody, I had never been to church but two times in my life and never sat through a sermon. Never, ever in 18 years. I've never been to a church. I went to a funeral. Or I, went, I hadn't even been in a funeral at a church that I can remember of, but I'd gone to a Sunday school class twice. 
Nobody ever preached against cigarettes. My mom and daddy smoked both of them. I started smoking when I was, well, just before I was born. And uh, and so I'd sneak them for mama and daddy, and and I smoked, and my daddy smoked. Everybody I knew smoked. The Surgeon General didn't even know it was bad for your health. And uh, all the cowboys smoked. You know, you've seen them. Yeah. So I went to church that night, and the preacher preached on every sin I'd ever committed. I mean, I listen, it was bad enough. I'm not being facetious. I thought that my brother-in-law had told the pastor about me and do everything that I prayed. Honestly, he preached on everything I'd ever done and some things I'd even thought about doing I hadn't done, but I was trying to get around to them. <laughs> Except smoking. He never said nothing about smoking. So that night, I saw myself as a sinner. I came down an old-fashioned altar and said, Lord, will you forgive me and save me? I believe in Jesus Christ. And God saved me. The Holy Spirit came to live in my heart and changed me, made me new. When I walked out the door, the preacher said, if you died right now, where would you go? I thought for a second, to heaven. He said, that's right. Why? I said, because I have Christ. He said, that's right. And literally, I got in my car, reached in my pocket, and took me out of Campbell, and as real as I'm standing before you today, something inside of me said, that don't belong to you anymore. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Now it took me a while mm. for the Spirit to work it out of my flesh, but never again did I smoke a cigarette that I enjoyed as I did before I got converted mm. by the power of God. You know, some people say, well, now babies have got to learn and grow. Now let me tell you this, you get this, Babies do have to learn and turn and go. And a lot of times, children are born, babies are born, and they don't know how to latch on and nurse. Have any of you ever known a situation yeah. you had to teach a baby how to nurse and yeah. how to latch on? But you've never been a baby born, a healthy baby, never been one born, that you had to teach to want to nurse. Hear me? That's good. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, you have to teach them how, but you don't have to teach them to want it. Because mm. they come forth crying. They want some milk. They want a nurse. They want that which is natural for them to want. When you're born again, <coughs> you may have to learn some mechanics about God and what He says. And, and you know, it worried me for a long time after I got saved because my grandmama had read me that part over there in the Old Testament that said, you can't eat any fish with a skin, only with scales. Every time I ate catfish, it worried me to death that I was going to hell. <laughs> I was glad when I found out God had cleansed everything, especially catfish. Amen. You may have some mechanics of some things you've got to learn, but I'm going to tell you, if you have no hunger for God, you have no hunger for the Word of God, you have no long hunger for the people of God, you have no hunger for the things of God, you don't know God. That's right. That's true. You're still unborn. And that goes for your children and your grandchildren and your co-workers and your mama and your daddy and whoever else it is that are around you. Right. For when a man is born again, he's born with a new nature and a desire for the things of God. Mm. And he said, you can tell. These are manifest. These are made known. Yeah, you know what's in the heart of a man. Mm. So we made new. Look in chapter 2 of 1 John. Chapter 2. 1 John, verses 3. If I can find my place. And hereby we do know that we know Him. You say, how can you know that you know Him? Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Mm -hmm. Now how can you know Him, how can you know you know Him if you don't obey Him, mm. you can't. That's right, preacher. He said, you cannot have assurance of your salvation a disobedient rebel against God. Mm. Hereby do we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith I know Him and keepeth not His commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in Him. So I don't care who he is. He can tell you about what he did when he was 12 or what he did when he was 6 or what he did when he was 20 and how he went to an altar and how he used to be in the church. But he that saith, I know Christ, and he is not surrendered and submitted to the things of God, God said, he's lying to you. 
He's a liar. A man said to me one time, he said, well, I, I led his two sons to the Lord, and he spent all his time trying to get them to miss church to take him to the racetrack. And I tried to <coughs> win him, and he told me, he said, well, I'm saved. I've been saved uh, a long time, he said. But I got out of church about 20 years ago when my pastor got killed on a motorcycle, and I didn't like the new pastor. And uh, by the way, this ain't a popularity contest. If you got a man of God that preaches the Word of God, then the Holy Spirit of God didn't tell you to leave where there's a preaching of the Word of God. And he said, I haven't been back to church much. So I talked to him through the weeks and months, and I said, well, do you read your Bible? Well, not like I ought to. And, and so nothing else he did. He didn't go to church like he should. Mm. So one day I was talking to him, and he just got tired of me, and he said, well, I don't believe like you do. He said, uh, <coughs> you're a free will Baptist and you believe uh, that you can lose your salvation. He said, I believe in once saved, always saved. He said, so I don't believe you like you do. And I said, who told you I believe that you could lose your salvation? I didn't tell you that. He said, well, that's what you believe, isn't it? I said, no, let me show you what I believe. And I read him this verse. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. I said, that's what I believe. Mm. Whosoever uh, that... Keep not his commandments is not born of God. And I said, I believe this. He said, I've never seen that. Let me see it. I came in my New Testament and he read that verse. And hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. He said, I've never read that before. I said, well, listen, it's not about doctrine of, 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 of security. It's not about uh, how you see the tribulation period or the millennium, the, the prophecy, the coming of the Lord. It's about having a relationship with Jesus Christ that's real because you've been born again. <laughs> And when you tell me you've been born again and you have no desire for God in the things of God and for 20 years you've never lived for God, you don't even bother about living for God. You want to take your boys out of church and take them to the racetrack and you have no concern for their spiritual health. I said, God says, you're a liar. And one week later to the day, he put a double barrel shotgun in the roof of his mouth and a yardstick, he pushed both triggers and blew his brains out in the basement of his house. Now, folks, listen, there's a whole lot of room for us to disagree on some things, but there ain't no room to disagree with the new birth. No. You're either born again or you're lost. Amen, preacher. And when you're born again, you made a new creature, or God's a liar, and I'll bet on God, not you. Amen. You say, preacher, you sound mad. I'm mad at the devil. Yeah. How much is the new birth? Is it really real? Mm. Amen. Well, turn in your Bible to the book of Luke, and we'll get to the sermon. This all been introduction. And we got two minutes to get the sermon in. <laughs> but I ain't going to let you out of eight. <laughs> I'm working harder than y'all. You're just sitting there, right? <laughs> Look at verse 18. I'll hurry. A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what? Shall I do? That's Luke 18, verse 18. And the son of the ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good save one that is God. In other words, this man came to Jesus. He was rich. He was a ruler. He came to Jesus and he said, What must I do to have eternal life? That's a pretty good question. Would you say no? Yes, it is. And he came to the right person. Would you say yes or no? Yes. He did. Was he asking the right question? We need to ask. Yes. He said, good master, how can I have eternal life? Jesus said, well, let me get you straight on something about who I am. He said, there's only one good, and that's God. And if I'm not God, I'm not good. And if I'm good, I'm God. Amen. You're never going to be born again until, first of all, you understand that Jesus is God. That's right. And he simply said to him, I'm God. Mm -hmm. Eternal life begins with the fact that you understand that Jesus didn't die on the cross simply as a man. He died as the God-man. God incarnate on the cross of Calvary. He yes. shed His blood for us. Yes. He identified with us in the flesh. He was God in the Spirit. He was a God-man. No one ever been like Him. No one ever else will be like Him. He was God in the flesh. And it was God who died for us on the cross mm -hmm. and rose again the third day. And then He said to Jesus, Thou knowest the commandments, or Jesus said to him, Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. He gave him all the horizontal commandments, have man's relationship with man. 
And he said, the rich young ruler said to him in verse 21, and he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. I don't think he was lying. I believe he was saying what I've just said, that nobody's perfect, but it's been my goal in life to keep these commandments and be good to my neighbor and do what I should do. I don't think he'd ever committed adultery in the sense of physical, but I think overall what he is saying is, that's how I've tried to live by these commandments. Mm. So Jesus said unto him, uh, in verse 22, Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lacketh thou one thing, Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come, and then there's two words that are vitally important, and follow me. He said, you want eternal life? He said, then stop living for this world and the things in it and follow me. Notice the reaction of the man. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was sorrowful, he said, How hard is the day to have riches to enter the kingdom of God? Now, will you get the picture with me? This man came, <coughs> asked the right question, the right person. He said to Jesus, I will know how to have eternal life. Jesus said, You think Jesus knows how to have eternal life? Yes. We're to him. We're yes. Jesus knows how to have yes, life. sir. He does. So when he came to Jesus, he said, What must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, Well, keep the commandments. He said, Well, which one? Jesus gave him all those commandments. He said, I've done a left checkbox. He said, Well, you like one thing. Go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me and you'll have life. Yes. Well, does Jesus understand that salvation is by grace through faith and all works? Mm, yes, he does. Doesn't he? Yes. He does. But why didn't he tell him that? Why didn't Jesus say, oh, by the way, it doesn't have anything to do with commandment keeping? Oh, no, 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 you got it all wrong. Mm. What it has to do with is my mercy and my grace will be given to you as a gift if you'll just ask me for it. Isn't that what Romans says? Mm. For by the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works, and it is made yeah. to us. So the answer is why Jesus told him to keep the commandments. And then Jesus told him, when he said, I've done all that, Jesus said, Well, go show everything that you have and give to the poor, and you come and follow me in your life. Jesus must have been badly mistaken or he hated this man. If you go to Mark's gospel, you'll find that as he walked away, the Bible says that and how Jesus loved him. Mm-hmm. But why did Jesus tell him that? Because he understood something, being God, that you and I can't understand all the time. And that is that this man had an idol that he would not, for any purpose, give up. Mm-hmm. And it was his possession. Mm-hmm. Jesus understood that. Jesus is saying you can't be born again until you're tired of yourself and tired of all God's of you and all you want is to come and have me. Yeah. When you come to that place, you can be born again by the Spirit of God and you can have life. That's good. Right. Mm. And the man understood it, by the way. Yes, sir. He understood it. Now, he could have put down almost anything. Jesus could have said, go and quit your adulterer. Get out of your adulterer's bed and come and follow me. He could have said, quit your adulterer and come and follow me. He could have said, quit coveting and come and follow me. He chose to dwell in on the man's God, and his man's God was his mere material possession. Now listen to me. Listen to me. There are people who won't be in this church some morning, or some night, or Wednesday night, or some of all of them, because their God is the dollar bill and what they can accomplish in this world, and they have no time for God, and no time for the things of God, and if they do, they have to say what it is, and squeeze it in, and run and kick their ass, and check their block off to God, but their heart is not with God, their heart is not with God's church, their heart is not with God's work, their heart with this world, and the things that are in this world, and they will give me the blame that they've been born again in the middle of Christ. Mm. 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 But, there's another man in chapter 19. Look at chapter 19. And Jesus entered uh, and passed through Jericho. And we behold, uh, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. 
and he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was a little statue and he ran before and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him for he was to pass that way and when Jesus came to the place he looked up and saw him and said unto him Zacchaeus make haste and come down for today I must abide at thy house and he made haste and came down and notice received him joyfully mm. now Jesus didn't even tell him he had to receive it mm. he just said Zacchaeus come down and go home with you today he came down and received him joyfully. Now notice, and when they saw it, they murmured, saying that he is gone to be the guest, which is a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore unto him full foe. Jesus hadn't said nothing about his possession. But he knew as a tax collector he'd been embezzling money from people and uh, swindling them out of money and that he had neglected the poor and he said, if I've, I'll give my goods a fourth of them to the poor and if I've taken anything, everything that I've done wrong and took from people, I'll make it right and give it back to them. And then Jesus said unto him, verse 9, this day is salvation, eternal life, come to this house. Amen. Two men. We're close to <laughs> So Zacchaeus comes to church tonight with us, Sunday morning. And he comes to church. And when the preacher gives the invitation, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to be right with God, you'll come and give your heart to God. So Zacchaeus comes. Bruce, come on up here. I'm not going to make case you do that tonight. I embarrassed him on last night. There's Vicky. I'll never, she'll never forgive me. So Zach, the, the, the rich young ruler comes to church Sunday morning and in a moment of emotion he wants eternal life. So he comes and he kneels on the altar. And on that altar I come to him as a preacher or a soul winner and I say to him uh, why'd you come? He I want eternal life. I want eternal life. And I say to him well, if you believe in Jesus Christ, He'll save your soul. If you'll ask Him to come to your heart and be your Savior, He'll save you. Would you like to do that? Absolutely. All right, then pray with me. Dear Lord, Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Forgive me. And Lord, I want you to be my Savior. Lord, I want you to be my Savior. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I stand up. And I say, do you really mean that? Mm, yes. And he did. And we'll tell him he has eternal life. Now let me ask you a question. Does he have eternal life? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Not yet. No, he don't. He don't have eternal life. See, he's a rich young woman. See, he's got a God. Now I can see he's got a God. But he's got a God that's called material possession. He went through some religious emotion. I couldn't see his heart, but Christ could. And remember, it is not what he prayed on the altar. Hear me now. Mm. That saves him is what the Spirit of God does to him when he's met the conditions of the Savior. Oh, that's good, preacher. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit of God that brings him into the new birth. And hear me. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit of God has not born him into the family of God until he's met the conditions of God. And that is that he's turned from all his idolatry. He's turned from self. He's turned from sin. He wants to be right with God. He wants a relationship with God. And the rich old ruler has been on this altar and told me he believes in Christ, but he don't want a relationship with God. He don't want to obey God. He loves this world and loves the things in this world and he's going to go out just as lost as he came in because it's the Holy Spirit of God that must birth him and the Holy Spirit of God will not birth a man who's not ready and does not want God. Mm. You said the truth. I'm not full. Praise God. You see, folks, 
We stabbed Christy down the a whole lot of folks. Wow. We sent them out the door. We can't get them back Sunday night. We can't get them back Wednesday night. And they have no real concern for the things of God. And they got a thousand excuses when you try to get them in. And they come in one time and then they go back out. And they come in again and they're gone and you can't see them. And we're trying, well, they got saved on such and such a day. No, they went to an altar and prayed the prayer. But they've never been born again because when they're born again, they're made a new creature. And everything about them takes over. And they may have to know how to latch on. But I'm going to tell you, they got a hunger for
Big stuff. I did not intend to go here tonight, but God wanted us to go here. For me and for you. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for truth and for the Spirit of God and for the new birth. And Lord, I'd not make it if it weren't by mercy and grace. But Lord, is that mercy and grace that changed me as an 18 year old boy. And since that day, He has pulled and wooed and guided, filled my heart. And when I would drift, You'd pull me back. Thank you, Lord. And I had a desire to be back. Yes. Lord, there was a hunger in my soul. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was out of fellowship with You in a way. Lord, help us as a church not to be embarrassed about taking a stand for the truth of God's Word. Mm-hmm. Help us to, Lord, try to win people to Christ. Yes. But may we, Lord, try to get them right with God, not just so we can carve a notch in our spiritual gun and say we had another decision. But may we seek conversions. Conversions where drunkards are made sober and the immoral are made pure and the rebels are made surrendered, whose lives are changed, whose homes are put back together because Christ becomes a sinner in that home and who live for something besides this stinking, rotting, dying world. Some people who just love you enough yes. to be in the house of God and to be in the book and to be in prayer is as natural to them as breathing the air around us. Mm. Help us, oh God, tonight. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you stand as Sister plays the piano? Maybe not you know somebody that, like that man I witnessed to who claims to know Christ but they're not living for Him. Why don't you come and find a place in order to pray for that person? Instead of like Miss Men, you're defending them. Why don't you begin to intercede for them and help them, God, to help them see themselves the way they really are? Maybe tonight you've made a profession of faith in your own life, but you've drifted away. Your heart's beginning to get cold to the things of God. And the Holy Spirit's been working and wooing, and He's been making you miserable and trying to draw you back. It would be a good night to come and find a place on the altar and say, Lord, I'm coming back home. I'm tired of pig pen. I'm tired of being out there. I don't fit there anymore. God help me. Won't you come right now? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just let God have His way. Let go and let God sell it. Get rid of it. It's not worth it. It's not worth the hassle. It's not worth it. Whatever it is that's drawing your attention and your heart away from your Lord, it's not worth it. Believe me, it'll drown you like lead in a drowning man's pocket. It'll drown you into nothingism. Rob you the thing that's best for you. Maybe you've never been born again. You really know it inside because you've never really loved Him. You've never really wanted just Him. You've never really just wanted to be right with God. You've never known what it meant to be born anew, to have a total new desire, total new life, a total new heart. Won't you come tonight and say, Father, I surrender. I want to be saved. I want to be born again. I don't want to rest my laurels just on the decision I made as a little child or even as an adult but never brought forth any fruit. Why don't you come right now while we tarry with these that are praying? 